passenger cabin aboard. During the voyage from Calcutta to New York in August and September of 1965, the cabin was occupied by Sri Aboy Charnavinda Bhaktivedanta Swami, whose age was listed as 69 and who was taken on board bearing a complimentary ticket with food. The Jaladuta, under the command of Captain Arun Pandya, whose wife was also aboard, left at 9 a.m. on Friday, August 13. In his diary, Srila Prabhupada noted, The cabin is quite comfortable, thanks to Lord Sri Krishna, for enlightening Sumati Maharaji for all these arrangements. I am quite comfortable. But on the 14th, he reported seasickness, dizziness, vomiting, Bay of Bengal heavy rains, more sickness. On the 19th, when the ship arrived at Colombo, Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, Prabhupada was able to get relief from seasickness. The captain took him ashore and he traveled around Colombo by car. Then the ship went on toward Kochi on the west coast of India. Janmastami, the appearance day of Lord Krishna, fell on the 20th of August that year. Prabhupada took the opportunity to speak to the crew about the philosophy of Lord Krishna and he distributed prasadam he had cooked himself. August 21st was his 70th birthday, observed 
without ceremony at sea. That's the same day the ship arrived at Cochin. That same day the ship arrived at Cochin and Srila Prabhupada's trunks of Srimad Bhagavatam volumes which had been shipped from Bombay were loaded on board. By the 23rd the ship had put out to this Red Sea where Srila Prabhupada encountered great difficulty. He noted in his diary, rain, seasickness, dizziness, headache, no appetite, vomiting. The symptoms persisted, but it was more than seasickness. The pains in his chest made him think he would die at any moment. In two days, he suffered two heart attacks. He tolerated the difficulty, meditating on the purpose of his mission. But after two days of such violent attacks, he thought that if another were to come, he would certainly not survive. On the night of the second day, Prabhupada had a dream. Lord Krishna, in his many forms, was rowing his boat. And he told Prabhupada that he should not fear, but should come along. Prabhupada felt assured of Lord Krishna's protection, and the violent attacks did not recur. The Jaladutha entered the Suez Canal on September 1 and stopped at Port Said on the 2nd. Srila Prabhupada visited the city with the captain and said that he liked it. By the 6th, he had recovered a little from his illness and was eating regularly again for the first time in two weeks, having cooked his own kitchari and puris. He reported in his diary that his strength renewed a little, little by little. Thursday, September 9th, his diary reads, to four this afternoon we have crossed over the Atlantic Ocean for 24 hours. The whole day was clear and almost smooth. I am taking my food regularly and have got some strength to struggle. There is also a slight tacking of the ship and I am feeling a slight headache also. But I am struggling and the nectarian of life is Sri Chaitanya Chaitamrita, the source of all my vitality. Friday, September 10th. Prabhupada's diary entry. Today the ship is plying very smoothly. I feel today better, but I am feeling separation from Sri Vrindavan and my lords Sri Govinda, Gopina, Radha Damodar. The only solace is Sri Chaitanya Chaitamrita, in which I am tasting the nectarian of Lord Chaitanya's Leela pastimes. I have left Bar Bhumi just to execute the order of Sri Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati in pursuance of Lord Chaitanya's order. I have no qualification, but I've taken up the risk just to carry out the order of His Divine Grace. I depend fully on their mercy so far away from Vrindavan. Srila Prabhupada often commented that uh, at the time when he left Vrindavan, he was nearly 70 years of age. No one would think of leaving. Because it is well known that if one passes away from the body in a holy town, especially in Sri Vrindavan town, then one is assured of going back to home, back to Godhead. Persons are therefore very intent on not leaving the dumps. They take vows not to leave the dumps. And especially at an advanced age, as Prabhupada was, they would never think of this type of journey. As we can see, uh, it was very difficult for Prabhupada. He suffered a very bad seasickness. And finally, at a certain point, uh, his heart uh, had difficulties and he suffered two heart attacks.
Now we can just appreciate the faith that Srila Prabhupada had uh, in his Guru Maharaj's order, which led him to take so much risk. In 1977, when Srila Prabhupada again contemplated going to the West, uh, he was again in a very precarious physical position. He was very ill. And it was clear that his time was limited in this world. Yet still, Prabhupada took the risk to go again to the West. And uh, when someone raised the question that your life may end at any time, why should you leave now? Prabhupada said, I have no such sentiment. Wherever I go, that is Vrindavan. So, this is the order of Sri Rupa Goswami, that wherever we go, we should take Vrindavan with us. Srila Prabhupada established this Sri Krishna Balaram Mandir for the devotees to be able to reside here and worship here, so that the mood, the atmosphere of Vrindavan would influence them and they would be able to retain that influence wherever they went. As we see, Prabhupada was in Vrindavan consciousness. On Janmastami, he celebrated Janmastami on the board of the ship and he spoke about the glories of Krishna and distributed prasad. And it's significant that the next day, Nanda Usa, which is his appearance day, there was no one there to celebrate with him. Uh, he celebrated simply by reading Sri Chaitanya Chaitanya Rita. Sometimes we feel sorry that we could not have been with Srila Prabhupada to assist and serve him at these difficult times. I remember once taking Srila Prabhupada in New York in a car and we went to uh, 72nd Street to the place where Prabhupada stayed in that loft. There also he stayed alone and with so much difficulty. He was typing his Srimad Bhagavatam purports and at one point his typewriter was lost. Stolen, not lost. I remember saying to Srila Prabhupada while we were driving that I wish that I could have known you at that time because actually I was living only nine blocks away from this place and I took Prabhupada to where I was staying. I showed him. I said, we were so close physically, but we were so very far away. So, this is such a rare passage, this boat journey. It's something like what happened when Maharaj, huh, what is that king who saved the Vedas? Satyapada, when he saved the Vedas, in a sense it's nothing less than that. That from the point of view of the entire world outside of India, there was nothing of Vedic understanding. And Prabhupada practically had to preserve the entire Vedas, complete with their culture, and carry it to the world. And uh, it's not as if he saved the Vedas in the form of many books, because practically what he did is he saved it in himself personally. That he himself was the personification of all Vedic knowledge. Uh, he knew all of the Vedas and the conclusion of the Vedas and he was capable of instructing the conclusions to others. So, so much was depending upon Srila Prabhupada. 
And whether Krishna allowed him to know it or not to know it, we can see how he uh, sensed and knew the importance of his mission. One time we went to visit one of Prabhupada's godbrothers, and uh, he stated at that time that we all, meaning the disciples of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, we all read how in every town and village of the world Krishna consciousness would spread. But we thought it was simply something, some poetry written in a book. We could not actually believe that such a thing was possible. But from reading this <coughs> poem of Srila Prabhupada's, in no way does he speak of it as something impossible. Rather, he speaks of it as a sure reality. It is certain to happen. Uh, he has so much faith in the words of the disciplic mind, and, and especially coming from his Guru Maharaj, that he has no doubt if he tries to carry out this order, it will certainly happen. So we should never think that the order of the disciplic succession can in any way be frustrated. Prabhupada used to tell us many times, he said, that Lord Chaitanya has already predicted that the Krishna consciousness movement will spread to every town and village. So it will certainly happen. The only question, the only doubt, is who is going to take credit for doing so. Otherwise, it's certain to happen. So, the establishment of this temple is meant to give us the strength to be able to follow Srila Prabhupada's own example, to take Krishna consciousness to every town and every village. This will actually please the acharyas in our mind. This will please Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. This will fulfill the purpose for which Srila Prabhupada traveled to the West. I'll read some more now. Prabhupada is moving across the Atlantic. After a 35-day journey from Calcutta, the Jaladuta reached Boston's Commonwealth Pier at 5.30 a.m. on September 17, 1965. The ship was to stop briefly in Boston before proceeding to New York City. Among the first things Srila Prabhupada saw in America were the letters A and P. Does anyone know what that stands for? Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company. It is a chain of supermarkets, A and P, painted on a pier front warehouse. The gray waterfront dawn revealed the ships in the harbor, a conglomeration of lobster stands and drab buildings, and rising in the distance, the Boston skyline. Prabhupada had to pass through U.S. immigration and customs in Boston. His visa allowed him a three-month stay, and an official stamped it to indicate his expected date of departure. Captain Pandya invited Prabhupada to take a walk into Boston, where the captain intended to do some shopping. They walked across a footbridge into a busy commercial area with old churches, warehouses, office buildings, bars, tawdry bookshops, nightclubs, and restaurants. Prabhupada briefly observed the city, but the most significant thing about his short stay in Boston, aside from the fact that he had now set foot in America, was that at Commonwealth Pier he wrote another Bengali poem entitled Markine Bhagavad Dharma, teaching Krishna consciousness in America, and some of the verses he wrote on board the ship that day are as follows. My dear Lord Krishna, you are so kind upon this useless soul, but I do not know why you have brought me here. Now you can do whatever you like with me. But I guess you have some business here. Otherwise, why would you bring me to this terrible place? Most of the population here is covered by the material modes of ignorance and passion. Absorbed in material life, they think themselves very happy and satisfied and therefore they have no taste for the transcendental message of Vasudeva Krishna. 
I do not know how they will be able to understand it. But I know that your causeless mercy can make everything possible because you are the most expert mystic. How will they understand the mellows of devotional service? O oh Lord, I am simply praying for your mercy so that I will be able to convince them about your message. All living entities have come under the control of the illusory energy by your will, and therefore, if you like, by your will, they can also be released from the clutches of illusion. I wish that you may deliver them. Therefore, if you so desire their deliverance, then only will they be able to understand your message. How will I make them understand this message of Krishna consciousness? I am very unfortunate, unqualified, and the most fallen. Therefore, I am seeking your benediction so that I can convince them, for I am powerless to be, do so on my own. Somehow or other, O oh Lord, you have brought me here to speak about you. Now, my Lord, it is up to you to make me a success or failure as you like. O oh, spiritual master of all the worlds, I can simply repeat your message. So if you like, you can make my power of speaking suitable for their understanding. Only by your causeless mercy will my words become pure. I am sure that when this transcendental message penetrates their hearts, they will certainly feel gladdened and thus become liberated from all unhappy conditions of life. O oh Lord, I am just like a puppet in your hands. So if you have brought me here to dance, then make me dance, make me dance. O oh Lord, make me dance as you like. I have no devotion, nor do I have any knowledge, but I have strong faith in the holy name of Krishna. I have been designated as Bhakti Vedanta, and now if you like, you can fulfill the real purport of Bhakti Vedanta. Signed, the most unfortunate, insignificant beggar, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. What is the quality that most characterizes this poem? Prabhupada's total humility. Total, total humility. He is not thinking that he's capable of doing anything. But he is certain that Krishna can do everything. Krishna is the master of all mystics. Uh, nothing is impossible for Krishna. So he's simply appealing. And after all, this is all that a devotee ultimately can do, who preaches. He can appeal. Prabhupada once wrote a letter in regard to making more devotees. Prabhupada said that we cannot make someone a devotee, but Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is in the heart of all living entities. So we can pray to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who is in their hearts to please lift the curtain of illusion and help them to take shelter from Krishna's lotus feet. So, this prayer is such a beautiful example of Jiva Doya, showing mercy to the conditioned souls. Prabhupada is appealing, I can do nothing, I'm insignificant, I'm a puppet. He calls himself a puppet and he requests Krishna, make me dance, make me dance, make me dance. And we see how that best quality of a Vaishnava, humility, was always present in Prabhupada's personality. No matter how great the success Prabhupada achieved was, he never became proud. In fact, the only time I saw Prabhupada become proud was when he would say, I have so many nice disciples. He said, I have a right to be proud of this. I have so many nice disciples. Krishna has sent me so many nice disciples. I saw Prabhupada once say like this. He said, I feel proud to hear. And when a disciple would write of the success of some preaching, Prabhupada would say, this makes my chest swell with pride. That my disciples are preaching in such a wonderful way. So out of 
Again, he did not become proud for his own achievement, but seeing his disciples' activities, seeing others' activities, that gave him some sense of pride. And he certainly was proud to be representing uh, the greatest of all lines of the su succession, the Brahma Manfa Gaudiya Sampradaya. On the 19th of September, Jaladuta sailed into New York Harbor and docked at a Brooklyn pier at 17th Street. Srila Prabhupada saw the awesome Manhattan skyline, the Empire State Building, and like millions of visitors and immigrants in the past, the Statue of Liberty. Jai Jai Radhesha, Jai Krishna Balaram. Srila Prabhupada was dressed appropriately for resident of Vrindavan Dham. He wore kanti mala, neck beads, and a simple cotton dhoti, and he carried japa mala, an old chudder or shawl. His complexion was golden, his head shaven, sika in the back, his forehead decorated with a whitish Vaishnava tila. He wore pointed rubber, white rubber slippers, not uncommon to sadhus in India. But who in New York had ever seen or dreamed of anyone appearing like this Vaishnava. He was possibly the first Vaishnava sannyasi to arrive in New York with uncompromised appearance. Of course, New Yorkers have an expertise in not giving much attention to any kind of strange new arrival. Srila Prabhupada was on his own. He had a sponsor, Mr. Agarwal, somewhere in Pennsylvania. Surely someone would be there to greet him. Although he had little idea of what to do as he walked off the ship onto the pier. Prabhupada said, I did not know whether to turn left or right. He passed through the dockside formalities and was met by a representative from Traveler's Aid, sent by the Agarwals in Pennsylvania, who offered to take him to the Cindy ticket office in Manhattan to book his return passage to India. At the Cindy office, Prabhupada spoke with the ticket agent, Joseph Forrester, who was impressed by his unusual passenger's vision of appearance, his light luggage and his apparent poverty. He regarded Prabhupada as a priest. Most of Cindy's passengers were businessmen or families, so Mr. Forster had never seen a passenger wearing the traditional Vaishnav dress of India. He found Srila Prabhupada to be a pleasant gentleman who spoke of, quote, the nice accommodations and treatment he had received aboard the Jaladutta. Prabhupada asked Mr. Forrester to hold space for him on the ship to India, returning. His plans were to leave in about two months, and he told Mr. Forrester that he would keep in touch, carrying only 40 rupees cash, which he himself called, quote, a few hours spending in New York, close quotes and an additional twenty dollars he had collected from selling three volumes of the Bhagavatam, the Captain Pandya, Srila Prabhupada, with umbrella and suitcase in hand, and still escorted by the Traveler's Aid representative, set out for the Port Authority bus terminal to arrange for his trip to Butler. <laughs> it sounds like someone going for the first time into outer space to a distant planet. It is no less dangerous, no less awesome a task. And, you know, as we watch astronauts supposedly go to other planets, it sounds like this. Prabhupada landing in a foreign planet, a foreign world. So different in consciousness from his own consciousness. And yet, not intimidated because he has Krishna. He is with Krishna, he's with his Guru Maharaj's water, and he doesn't feel alone. Prabhupada told me, he said, I never for a moment ever felt alone. I always felt the presence of my Guru Maharaj. But therefore he didn't feel alone. And uh, he said, I didn't know whether to turn left or turn right. Krishna was leading him, left and right. Krishna was making the arrangement. When one is so surrendered to Krishna as Srila Prabhupada is, we can see that Krishna doesn't neglect his devotee. And Krishna promises like this throughout the uh, scriptures that if you fully surrender, then I will look after everything for you. 
So, uh, Prabhupada had this dependence upon Lord Krishna. We know that as Prabhupada arrived there and sat down, later on he, we uh, heard that they interviewed one gentleman who had sat with Prabhupada on a park bench, and Prabhupada described, I think my meaning was you did some of those interviews. But my, His Holiness, my meaning was did many of the interviews were with the Lama and the Rady. The one person was met who had sat next to Srila Prabhupada in a park bench in Manhattan. And Prabhupada was describing to him uh, so many temples and all kinds of ex- 108 temples and so many things which uh, were, you know, either going to happen or had happened. It was hard to say from his description. And Prabhupada said the only thing that is separating him is time. And the old man who was sitting with Prabhupada asked, what is your mission? Prabhupada said, my mission is to uh, establish 108 temples to preach the glories of the holy name, to translate the Srimad Bhagavatam, and when those things are done, I will go back. So all of these things were accomplished by Srila Prabhupada. We should certainly meditate on this wonderful uh, anniversary celebration. How many years is it now? 29 years ago, Prabhupada took this journey and landed on this day in America. Anybody like to add some words, Guijan Prabhu, some thoughts. Guijan Prabhu is remembering that at one time Prabhupada came to Boston and he told Satrup Marsh that I want to again go to Commonwealth Pier and no one knew how to get there and Prabhupada got in the car and he immediately said turn left, turn right, do this, do this and he drove directly to that place, found the location. I think that Prabhupada would be uh, very pleased today that each of us who are his followers would try to take strength from his glorious example and think how we can also establish Krishna consciousness somewhere or somehow in a wonderful way as Prabhupada did. This will be the real demonstration of our devotion to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, it may not be by opening a temple or it may be by whatever way it is. Each person will be able to serve Prabhupada's mission in a certain way. But we should do it in such a way that it requires some great degree of surrender, uh, some great risk. Krishna consciousness doesn't mean to play it safe. Prabhupada did not play it safe. Going on board the Jaladuta at the age of 70 wasn't playing it safe. He took maximum risk. And when you take maximum risk, what happens? You have to depend upon the mercy of Guru and Guru. And that's how you make so much advancement in Krishna consciousness. When you're put into difficult situations, as Queen Kunti prayed, put me into so many difficult situations, my Lord.
The first time I saw Prabhupada's photo was in 1966, um, down in the Lower East Side. There was a flyer that was printed advertising Prabhupada speaking uh, at the uh, 26th 2nd Avenue Temple. And um, at the time I uh, was interested in Indian philosophy and I'd studied it for some years. But for some reason, uh, at that time I wasn't able to take advantage and come in contact directly with Prabhupada. Um, instead, I would regularly visit Tompkins Square Park and at one time there was a, uh, a bee-in gathering in which uh, for the first time Prabhupada's disciples went out on their own. I think it was September or October in 66 and uh, I used to play the flute so I came there and I played the flute the whole time while they did kirtan for two or three hours. That was my first uh, contact with the devotees. So you saw Prabhupada's picture there? They had like a... No, I had already gotten a... I had received a... Uh, um, a flyer with a photograph of Prabhupada on it. But uh, even though one of my friends uh, encouraged me to come to the temple, somehow or other I I was hesitant to do so. And uh, finally you did, and was Prabhupada there? No, I didn't come to the temple. The ne I went out to San Francisco. Okay, excuse me one sec. Um, in 67, in the spring of 67, and um, Again, I came into contact with devotees. Uh, I was living up at a farm, a community up in Northern California, Morning Star, where Prabhupada had come. And uh, there were devotees who were chanting, so I started to chant. That's where I actually started to chant Hare Krishna. And uh, gradually, um, I moved down to San Francisco. And the first time I met Prabhupada was in the San Francisco temple and uh, was either at the end of 67 or just the beginning of 68, right at the turn of the year. And Prabhupada was sitting on the Vyasa Sun and uh, leading kirtan. And I immediately, I had had contact already at Morningstar, so I knew how to do kirtan. In fact, I had gotten a copy of the album, the Happening album. So throughout the summer and fall of 67, I used to play that album and uh, just chant along and dance. So, but still I hadn't come to the temple. And some of the devotees from uh, Morningstar were, who, who had gone up there came down again to, to San Francisco and they invited me to the temple. And that's when I came. Do you remember anything about that first lecture that you said it was like no. hard or No, in fact, I didn't stay for the uh, lecture because I was uh, attending some bogey gurus, <laughs> bogus gurus uh, lectures. So I would stay for the kirtan, and just before Prabhupada would begin speaking, I would leave. <laughs> and that went on for a few sessions, and then after a while, Someone suggested, why don't you stay, and I, I did stay. And then I started to more, attend, more regularly attend. Did anything, uh, what differentiated Prabhupada from his other bogey you say about him? Well, the person I was uh, visiting was actually a Westerner. He was a, he was a uh, physicist, I think, and um, a scientist of some type. So he had a very, very different approach to spirituality. A prophet was very traditional and he was very grave and um, you know it was a very religious experience. Uh, whereas this other person was a much more clinical type of approach to spirituality. He had some type of meditation interwoven within his scientific presentation. So it was sort of a blend of science and spirituality. And Prophet was obviously coming from a very ancient tradition.
first personal experience I had with Prabhupada was uh, he was living in an apartment just next to the temple on 518 Frederick Street. And um, on Monday, Wednesdays, and Friday nights, we would have a program. Prabhupada would talk at the temple. And Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays, he would have darshan in the evenings at his apartment. So the devotees invited me for one of these darshans. And uh, I, at one of the darshans, I asked Prabhupada. It was a, a Gargamuni had um, requested Prabhupada to sing the Chintamani prayers, which Prabhupada had done very beautifully. And uh, asked afterwards, he asked if anyone had any questions, so I raised my hand. The draft board was, you know, a problem for every one of us at that age. So I was very concerned about whether or not I'd be drafted because America was at war with, in Vietnam. And so I asked Prabhupada um, to describe what the spiritual world was like. And he said to me, uh, he looked back and he looked at me and he said, in the spiritual world, he said, the spiritual world is a place where there are no draft boards. And he told the story. He said there was once a uh, Christian minister who was preaching in England to coal miners, and uh, he was describing the hell that awaited someone if they didn't accept the shelter of Jesus. And uh, he said that uh, hell is a terrible place, very, very dark, very dank and cold and wet. He said no one would want to go there. So all the coal miners were thinking, well, if that's hell, you know, where are we? We're already in hell. It doesn't sound very f fearful for us. This is where we live now. We're coal miners. So then the minister was trying to think of a way to convince them to take, to begin worshiping Jesus. So then finally he said, in, in uh, hell, there are no newspapers and there's no tea. And then they all said, oh, then we must worship Jesus. So Prabhupada said, so in the spiritual world, there are no draft boards. He said, is that all right? <laughs> I said, yes. Everybody said, jai. But actually there was a, another, another occasion. The first time I actually had the first exchange was a lecture Prabhupada gave in the Unitarian Church. And at this church, there very few people came to attend the program, perhaps five or six people. But I was one of the, I, I came as a friend of the devotees. I wasn't so much sitting in the audience, I sat with the devotees. And Prabhupada asked if there were any questions. And I raised my hand and I asked him a question. This is the first question I asked Prabhupada. I said, um, of course he was called Swamiji at the time. I said, Swamiji, um, what if I take up this process of Krishna consciousness? but I'm not able to become successful and finish it. And Prabhupada said that whatever you are able to achieve in this lifetime, you begin where you left off in your next lifetime. And he said that in, he said the same question was asked by Arjuna to Krishna. And uh, he said that in the material world, even if you're slightly successful in business or even fairly successful, still you may go bankrupt and you'll have nothing to show for it. But in spiritual life, even 1% gained is your permanent gain. Later on, uh, I was told, uh, as much later on I was told by, I think it was Upendra was the secretary at the time, the servant of Prabhupada, and he told me that Prabhupada uh, told him on the way home, that boy is very intelligent, he will become a devotee. Looseness in regard to, um, like the way we eat food, for example. Uh, practically, as soon as I joined, I was made the uh, pujari. Vishnu Jan and I were somehow told, okay, now you you can take care of the deities. Now, I remember Vishnu Jan, he had a very dirty um, type of shirt, 
It was like a long shirt that came below his knees, you know, which was like that was all he used to wear. It was a, a smock of some type. And uh, he, so he decided that this was, you know, the, the best type of clothing he had. So he, when he joined, he uh, cut it up and made clothes for the deities with it, for the little deities. And uh, <laughs> I recall that um, we used to uh, go across the street to the little store across the street and buy ice cream. I don't know what kind of ice cream. It was seal test ice cream. <laughs> I hope there weren't any eggs in it, but I don't know. I remember. Anyway, uh, we would just come into the temple, take the c cover off, and put it on the altar and just offer it up. That way it became prasad. There wasn't any question of putting a tulsi leaf. Nobody even thought of that. So uh, things were a little loose. I remember one of the favorite preps that they all used to have were, uh, was uh, sweet potatoes mashed, covered by marshmallows. <laughs> that was like a favorite everybody would regularly take. And I think marshmallows probably had some undesirable things in them. You know, how, how, did, how did the standard improve? Uh, how did the standard improve? Um, well, most things improved when we went to Los Angeles. When we got the first big temple on La Cienica Boulevard, that's where Prabhupada really started to establish the standard of deity worship more. And he further established it uh, in Seattle. He, he showed how to do the RT. In Los Angeles, he taught us Kiba Jaya prayer and, uh, you know, all the different... RTs, and then in Seattle, uh, he showed us how to do a full RT, a very long, lengthy RT, I think 49 minutes or something, very full RT, or 40, there were so many circles, seven circles of seven times, and um, he introduced the standards this way, gradually. But uh, in Los Angeles, even though he introduced it, still he gave more preference for Sankirtan. In fact, Prabhupada told us at that time, if necessary, I, he had put, uh, asked me to become the temple commander, the Mat commander, he called it. And uh, he said that, as one rule, he said, is that if necessary, you can lock the door of the temple and everyone can go out in sankirtan. So he, and practically we did that. There was only one person, Shilavati, who was left behind to do the deity worship, and the entire temple would go out. Every single person had to go out. I used to search everywhere for finding devotees. But sometimes devotees would hide. I even remember that one of the favorite hiding places is they would stand up in the toilet on the toilet seat, so that I, you know, because I'd look under the toilets to see if anyone was still in the bathroom. But they'd stand up on the toilet seat <laughs> to avoid being discovered, you know. So I'd have to just gradually call everybody out, put them in the van, and then we would go out. And uh, we used to stay out till midnight. We'd have two shifts. We'd go out for four hours in the afternoon and another three or four hours in the evening. And we'd come back around 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, take rest and get up at 7 o'clock. And then our morning prayer would start at 7. The deities got up early, but we would all get up. It was a sankirtan schedule. And actually, it was only when I came back after being in Europe for about a year, year and a half, I came back and uh, I discussed with the devotees there by that time who were in charge. I think um, I think Kurunda was in charge by then, and uh, I suggested to him because I thought I had been in charge and Kurunda had joined under me. So he sort of took advice from me, and I suggested to him that you should change the schedule now and don't stay out late. And uh, they, I think they did change it by that time. You know, after I came through Los Angeles, that was on the way to going to India in 1970. Did Prabhupada give you any instructions of, about how to do book distribution or? What to say to uh, people in the streets? Well, the first time I wrote a letter to Prabhupada, uh, the first letter I wrote to Prabhupada was all about Sankirtan. I told him what the results of Sankirtan were. See, what happened was that Prabhupada told us all the brahmacharis to get jobs because Jayananda was supporting the temple single-handedly. Prabhupada said it wasn't fair. So he said all the brahmacharis should go out and get jobs. So, you know, everybody did what they knew best. I remember Vishnu John, he decided that he was going to make flutes, bamboo flutes, and he used to stand on Haight Street, and he made all the flutes so that they played Hare Krishna. And he would just stand out on Haight Street playing Hare Krishna all day. And he said uh, he was a Brahmin. And he told me that I, would, I was a Sudra because I went to work for Kodak. 
See, Gurudas was working at Kodak, so Gurudas got me a job at Kodak, and it was a very, you know, one of these uh, high-tech high tech jobs. I would get the uh, film canister and break it in half. That was my job. <laughs> break the film canister, put it, break the film canister. And then when they saw that I was really capable of doing that, they moved me up to a higher position where I would run the uh, film through a heating elements, and it would be developed this way. And then I would get to bring it to Gurudas, who was in the dark room developing. He got a bigger salary than I did. So you can imagine what this was like. But still, it was yoga, and I felt it was yoga. I'd give the whole check to the temple, and every day I just you know, looked forward to the lunch break. I'd immediately go out and have my little lunch, and uh, I'd go out and with Gurudas and take lunch, and we'd have some cartels and do some kirtan. And it was the only thing that saved me was that lunch break. But after a month or two of this, it was unbearable. Gargan, when he went to, uh, to M Montreal and talked to Prabhupada, and Prabhupada said that if they don't want to do this, then let them go out on the street and do chant on the streets. So we had an Istagosti, and uh, we discussed this, and I volunteered that I would organize it, because I wanted to get out of that job. So <laughs> I was very eager to, or I was ready to do anything to get out of that job. So uh, we organized the high Nam, the first high Nam party, I think. With the, it was really the first high Nam party that was on a regular basis going on in this country. And I remember the party was uh, Mukunda Maharaj. Of course, he was just Mukunda Das at that time, Mukunda Prabhu, Jamuna Prabhu, um, uh, Vishnu Jan, myself, and Murali Dar, who became the great artist. Murida would just hold the sign. There were five people the first time. That was the first regular. Those were the regulars. Mukunda uh, would play the Madunga. I learned how to play the Madunga from him. And, uh, and Vishnu John would chant and lead the singing. And Jamuna would also lead the Kirtan. And Murida would hold the sign. And that was our Kirtan party. So we did about twelve dollars the first time. I thought this you know, went back to the temple. Gargamuni had a little shop. And I said, Gargamuni, we did twelve dollars. He said, Wow. He said, I'm gonna give up my shop. This is big. This has huge potential. <laughs> he was ready to give up his shop. So uh, the next day I decided to take back to Godheads with us. And when the people give a donation, I give them a back to Godhead and the collections by the end of five days it had gone up to forty dollars. And I wrote Prabhupada day by day how it increased. The Prophet wrote me this letter and said, Don't worry so much about money. He said, If Krishna wants, he can give you the whole USA. The question is, what will you do with it? Do you know what to do with it? So it was a sobering letter. And um, gradually Prabhupada did give us instructions. He loved the Harinam party. I mean when I when he came back, I had been initiated after about a month of being in the temple. And then Prabhupada left for uh, the other parts of America. When he came back in September, uh, he, I remember he came to the, uh, at the airport first, I remember greeting Prabhupada, and I garlanded Prabhupada and embraced him. And Prabhupada embraced me. I just was, I don't know why I did that, but that, somehow I did that. And uh, then when we came back to the temple, uh, Prabhupada gave out his garlands, and I, he, at one point he, Someone said, Prabhupada's calling you. I couldn't believe that Prabhupada would call me up, because I, but Prabhupada called me up, and he, he, he gave me a bond, and then, and then he asked to see me the next day. And so I came to see him in his apartment, and the first thing he said is, Krishna has given you the ability to organize. Now you organize this movement very nicely for him. Because he was very pleased. He had received a lot of reports about the Sankirtan from Gurudas and Jamuna, and Mukunda, who had gone to Montreal on their way to London, they told Prabhupada all about it. We, we started to organize. We, uh, we got, you know, regular uh, get-up with yellow, I think it was yellow uh, dhotis and shirts. So we were very, you know, smart-looking out there, and Prabhupada appreciated it. 
actually when we finally went to LA we really organized we would court orchestrate a little bit how we would dance on certain you know words we'd say hey go Vinda and we'd all turn around and go the other direction and because it was Hollywood <laughs> so we I used to get everybody to rehearse a little bit and uh, I would inspect all the devotees how they looked so they looked very nicely and uh, but Prabhupada was very pleased with this high nun party he decided when he left San Francisco to open the temple in Seattle Gargamuni and Upendra had gone there and Prabhupada decided that the Sankirtan party should go with him and at that point Jayananda went to Prabhupada and asked Prabhupada Shri Prabhupada well again it was Swamiji at the time he said Swamiji you know I'd like to travel with the Sankirtan party and Prabhupada said, but you are the president? And he said, I think this is more important. And then uh, Prabhupada, uh, Prabhupada said, well, what will you do? And he said, I'll be the driver. And Prabhupada thought, for some reason, very good, you can go. And he was willing, to, he thought so much about Sankirtan that he was willing to let the top devotee, the person who was maintaining the whole temple, who was the temple president, who was prepared to let him go to become the driver of the Sankirtan party. To join to join a party that way. Actually, I'm talking about Jainanda, remember the first time that Jainanda asked me to give class was the second day I was in the temple. Second day I moved in the temple, Jainanda said, okay, you have to give class. I said, well, I don't know the philosophy. How am I going to give class? He said, it doesn't matter. Just speak from your own realizations. <laughs> so I don't remember what I said, but that's how it went. I remember Jainanda used to give class and he'd sit there and he'd just be rocking back and forth and his class consisted mostly of descriptions about the different passengers he picked up in his taxi. Oh, this person was suffering like anything, Jainanda was saying. He said, I, you know, he said, listen to this story and then he described what the passenger said to him. He said, I had to tell him this and this and the whole Bhagavatam class would be like that. And, uh, I remember Gargamuni used to give class. He always used to talk about Indra becoming a hog. And he said, oh, there's a hog and there's a she-hog and a little... He said, just sex. And I thought, well, this is the way Gargamuni used to give class. It was his favorite topic, how Indra fell down and became a hog. I remember when Gargamuni one day was driving me, because I, I, Gargamuni had his next door was the gift shop that he had. And uh, Gargamuni was quite a businessman. And he was a born businessman. I mean, he used to go out on Haight Street with his beads, his long beads, and he'd just sell them. He'd go into the tourist buses and say, you know, hippie beads, hippie beads. I mean, he was not a hippie. Everyone he was not really a hippie. He was just always a businessman. So uh, I remember he would, uh, one time we were, you know, he was quite strong. One day he was driving me in the car when I was a new devotee. And I, he said, he looked at me and said, you know, he said, I only have one friend. That's Prabhupada. Nobody else. I thought, Phew, this is really a heavy religion, you know. <laughs> I thought, this is really heavy. It was so heavy. He said, I have one friend, and that's Prabhupada. The devotees were very devoted to Prabhupada. Samsara Gava Nalali Galo Ranarya karya niyagana ganatva Atrasya karya niyagunar navasya Bande guda sri chara naravinda Mahaprabhu remember early days how we would be so enthusiastic to serve Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada would come out of his house four or five blocks away from the temple in San Francisco and we'd be out there to do kirtan for him, right? Then he'd get in the car and drive and we would run full speed to be at the temple before he got there. Of course we'd tell the driver to take a few detours. And we would run full speed and then we'd be out there doing kirtan when he'd come in and Prabhupada was just beaming. Because there was affection or love. In the old days in Los Angeles, when we all joined, 
we, I joined in San Francisco, but when we all came to Los Angeles, 70 devotees, say, in the temple. Nobody was married yet. All the men lived in one room, all the women lived in another room. 20 women, or 15 or 20 women in one room. Everybody knows what that means. But they did it. They all did it. And no, they hardly fought. And all the men lived in one room together. It was so nice. Nobody had any separate room. We all had a little cubby hole where we put our personal clothing and we had a sleeping bag we'd stick on the top and at night we'd all just put out our sleeping bag and sleep and every it was a big family and it just attracted people like anything Prabhupada was a great negotiator. I remember when he wanted to increase the printing of BTG. At that time, we were printing 3,000 BTGs. It was done in New York by cycle style. And Prabhupada had decided he wanted to up the printing to 20,000. And he wanted to print in Japan. That's what it really was. And he, I think he was trying for 10,000, but they wouldn't print less than 20,000 because it was an offset press. So Prabhupada called me. At that time, we had a pretty good Sankirtan party in Los Angeles by then. And uh, he called me to his room, and he asked me, um, he called me for lunch, that's what it was. And of course, his secretary and servant were not very keen on this, because, you know, they like to serve Prabhupada lunch, but what is, what is the point of serving one of their godbrothers lunch? They really didn't like it, but they had no choice. So Prabhupada, before lunch, he said, um, he said, you know, BTG, he told me about Dinah Pond, that they won 20,000. He said, I want to know if you will take responsibility for distributing 5,000 BTGs a month, your Los Angeles temple. Can you give me that order? So I thought for a second, and I said, because we were distributing of the 3,000, uh, we were doing 2,500. L.A. Temple was doing 2,500 of the 3,000 or 3,500 being printed. So I said, it's double, but we'll do it, 5,000. And the strength of that commitment then, Prabhupada um, took 5,000 order from San Francisco, New York, and London, and got 20,000. And then he fed me a very nice lunch. So it was sort of like, you know, how a person takes you out to dinner and then strikes a deal with you. So Prabhupada struck that deal with us. Guru Dev Kripa Bindu Diya Karo Ye Idase Trina Pekha Yoti Gina When I first uh, was managing in Los Angeles, Dayananda Prabhu was the temple president, and uh, Prabhupada made me the temple commander. Called him the Mutt. He said, "You're the Mutt commander." And he said, "Dayananda will be the temple president." And I said, "What's the difference?" And then I and I was supposed to manage the temple. I said, "Well, what, what does that mean? He's only the temple president, but he's, I'm doing all the managing, and he's simply sits there working for RCA." <laughs> he said, "Prabhupada said, don't worry." At the time of emergency, the temple president will step forward and say, follow me. So that is the temple president. And sure enough, that happened. We were at um, Hollywood Boulevard, and we were having our temple there in a storefront, and we were cooking, you know, dal every day, making the chong, and the spice smell was going up in this big office building on Hollywood Boulevard, and then the landlord said, vacate today vacate immediately and we were all on that street and then Dayananda Prabhu stepped forward and said follow me <laughs> I didn't know what to do I was sitting on you know on the on the side of the street back where I was before I met Prabhupada <laughs> and Dayananda arranged things so uh, anyway as a temple commander you know managing the one of the, I guess it was the first big temple naturally one begins to feel one's importance and gradually I was feeling very important, sitting in my office, and I could imagine that the whole temple was going on under my direction. 
and then, you know, at, at other times I might even manage that more things were going on under my direction, the city or who knows, you know, people get into such illusion. So one day Prabhupada called me to his room and he was looking at me and then he took out this picture, like this picture here, the Bhagavatam. And he said, do you understand the creation? So I said, well, I, I'm reading your book, Shri Prabhupada. And then he began to explain about how the creation is, that this planet of Goloka Vrindavan, which is in the spiritual sky, is bigger than the entire rest of everything. This one planet is bigger than all the other Vaikuntas, what to speak of the one quarter part of the material, the, the material side of creation. He said, this Goloka is so big, and on that Goloka is Radha and Krishna and all of their devotees. He <coughs> said, then there are so many Vaikuntha Lokas, and each one of these is unlimitedly big. He said, we have no conception of how big they are. And Lord Narayan is there in one of his features with his devotees. And then in this little corner of the creation, he said, this material universe, material creation takes place, and there are unlimited universes within. He said, how big this universe is, the scientists can't even get to the end of it. It's such a huge thing. He said, and there's uncountable numbers of these universes, and each one of them has so many planets, you know, of, and just like our earthly planet. He said, our planet Earth is very important. All the scientists in the world are simply thinking about it. He said, there are different continents, and in the continents there are different countries, just like the United States. And in the United States, so many big cities, just one city now, we read it, one city is one cell of a human cell, right, is more complicated practically than a whole city. So what to speak, in the city there are 5 million, 10 million people living. In, in some cities there are more. In China they have 100 cities with over a million people. 20, 25 cities with over 5 million people. They got many cities with over 10 million people. They got one, two cities with over 15 million people. And each person, each one of those people, <laughs> in each cell is more complicated than the whole city. So it's such a huge place. And as Prabhupada was saying, we're in Los Angeles, such a complicated, big, huge place. And he was going down, he said, and then we have our La Sienica Boulevard. At that time, the temple was on La Sienica, and on Waseca. And he said, on La Sienica Boulevard, there's one building there. And in that one building, there is one temple commander. You see, and his name is Tamal Krishna, and he thinks that he is so important. <laughs> So by that time I was thinking, and I was like somewhere smaller than an ant on the floor, and probably he thinks he's so important, he's running everything. Prabhupada. <laughs> was very eager to see the British people take to Krishna consciousness, as he was to see everyone in the world. But he always felt that England had some special purpose to play in the world uh, scheme. He always used to, because he was brought up in India, which was, after all, a colony of England. So he knew British history very well. And he used to often quote from British history. Uh, about how, of course, the sun never set on the British Empire, although it never rose in London, he used to say. <laughs> although it never set in the empire, it never rose in London. Because of the, of course, now it is a, a unique situation. Day after day, the sun rises here. But um, now we can see that practically the Krishna consciousness movement, again, is making those words come true. That it never, the sun has never set on the Krishna consciousness movement because it has stretched as a belt around the world. And Prabhupada hoped uh, that the people, especially he had great hope for the English people, that uh, they would appreciate this movement and take it up very nicely and offer it uh, to all of their uh, friends and associates. Uh, I remember when Prabhupada called me to England, I was serving in Los Angeles and I received a telegram, no, I received a phone call that you should please come here and organize the Sankirtan because it was not organized. This was in 1969. So 
Although I was responsible for our activities in Los Angeles of our society, Prabhupada called me here. And when I came here, I remember I was advised that I not dress like this. So I came in a coat and a hat and a tie and shirt, etc. So when I went to the through immigration, the immigration officials questioned me, why have you come here? So I said, I've come to see the English countryside. And they said, well, do you have any um, contacts here? So I said, yes, and I gave the name of one devotee. So they promptly called that devotee, and they, the devotee said, oh, yes, he has come here to organize our temples. <laughs> Devotees are very honest. <laughs> so, except for myself, you could see what kind of a devotee I was. So uh, the immigration official said, I think that you better sit aside. So he had me sit aside, and gradually everybody went through, and I was left alone. Then after a while, they asked me to please open my luggage. So I opened my luggage, and they found some uh, medical documents, because at the time, the United States was, as you remember, embroiled in a war with, uh, in Vietnam. So uh, I was more or less conscientiously objecting, and I had no interest to go to fight in such a war. So uh, by Krishna's arrangement, some doctor, when I went to the, um, for uh, getting into the military, there was a draft, they thought, oh, this, I came like this with robes on and shaved head, and I was chanting all the time the name of Lord Nishingadev. So they said, oh, this, <laughs> this person is mad. <laughs> so they declared me that I was uh, mentally incompetent. So the the immigration official said that uh, you're not you're there's something wrong with you. You're a mentally disturbed person. We can't let you in this country. So I said, well, you must have a psychiatrist here at the airport or some doctor. They said yes. I said, well, take me there to see him. So they took me there, and then I just started to preach to this medical officer at the airport. And after a while, we got very friendly, and he finally he said that this person is completely perfect and sane that it's very clear, you know, why they wrote this certificate, and we should immediately let him in our country. <laughs> so immigration immediately stamped me. They shook my hand and said, thank you very much for coming here. You go in. So when I went through, Makunda Maharaj had been waiting for me, and I was so disguised, he couldn't even recognize when I came. I don't know how immigration found me, huh? but he could not. So finally we met, and I came to see Prabhupada, and Prabhupada said that he had been praying to uh, Krishna, to he didn't know what had happened. He was very concerned. So then I came and saw Prabhupada. He was at Bari Place. We had our center. We had just acquired that place at Bari Place. And um, then, as I was saying this morning, we were in the temple at Soho Street. Prabhupada gave us an instruction. Now we want to have Radha and Krishna deities. So Radha and Krishna deities. We didn't know where we were going to find Radha and Krishna deities. We're here. In England, how will we find Radha and Krishna? But Prabhupada, this was in September, I believe, or October. And he said, in, by December, we must have the deities installed. So we were, every day, we were just in total anxiety. Myself and Mukunda, Shama Sundar, and Gurdas, and their wives, they were, everybody was in anxiety. Where is Krishna? Where is Krishna? So one day, Janaki Devi, the former wife of Mukunda Maharaj, she got a telephone call from one Indian gentleman who said that I have some deities and uh, I'd like you to come and see them. So Mukunda and I rushed over there to his home and then he took us into his study and he unveiled the deities of Radha Londonishvara. Have you all seen Radha Londonishvara? Everybody here? I think you must have it, Soho. So we saw these deities, and of course we were very overwhelmed. So we said, we have to tell our spiritual master about this immediately. And Prabhupada was staying at that time at some hotel near Regent's Park. He was right opposite Regent's Park. There was a hotel. He, he, would, he would visit the temple at Bari Place, but it hadn't been built yet. His quarters had not been finished, so he was staying at a hotel. So we rushed to the hotel, but Prabhupada was resting. And when he finally woke up, we said, Srila Prabhupada, we found Krishna. So he said, take me immediately. So we arranged and took Prabhupada in the van. Prabhupada came to this gentleman's home, 
And he was very sociable. He asked, where are you from? The man said, I'm from such and such a place in India. And he probably met his family members. And they went on talking for 30, 40 minutes. And Prabhupada seemed like he was totally, almost disinterested in the deities. I, I kept saying, sure, Prabhupada, the deities are over there. <laughs> he said, that's all right. So after a while, the man said, uh, Swamiji, wouldn't you like to see the uh, deities? So Prabhupada said, yes, I can see them. So then he took the cloth off and Prabhupada looked. And he said, oh. Then he asked me, he said, why don't you go and see how heavy she Shimanti Radharani's. So I lifted Radharani over. I said, she's not very heavy. And he asked Shamsana, why don't you see how heavy Krishna is? And Shamsana picked Krishna up and he said, that's not very heavy. So Prabhupada said, then, all right, we'll take them. <laughs> so the man was very surprised because he said, you know, well, we have to discuss this. They belong to a uh, committee and we have, you know, we'll have to have a meeting. But Prabhupada said, no, there's no problem because we have our van here. And he just told us now, take the deities. So we immediately walked with Radha and London Ishvara out of the door into the van. And the man just, you know, he and his family were following Prabhupada. Swamiji, Swamiji, please wait. You know, we have to discuss this. I, I can't do this immediately. Prabhupada said, you know, later on you can, we'll talk about it. We'll just take the deities. Now that we brought the van, they're in our arms. And Prabhupada said, drive. <laughs> just let us drive. So we drove. And when Prabhupada got a little bit of a distance, he said, now stop the car. And he turned around and he looked at the deities and he started to chant the prayers of Lord Brahma, Govinda Mahadi Purusham Tamaham Bajami, the Brahma Samhita prayers. And he said, Krishna is so kind that he has come to us. And in that way, Radha Ishara appeared for on account of Prabhupada's strong desire. Jindamani. He was so pleased. <laughs> we took the deities and he kept the deities in his own room. He kept the deities with him personally. And Jamuna Devi would come on a regular basis every day to sew for the deities and take their measurements. One morning Prabhupada called me there and he, he described how Krishna's flute should be and he made a drawing with a, it was like a crocodile and an elephant head that should be on the flute. Then he made out the menu for the feast. Then he had me make up a program, an invitation card. I remember, I, you know, you were invited to come and eat prasadam. Prabhupada said, do not write that. I said, he said, to honor prasadam. He said, we do not eat prasadam, we honor prasad. He also, I remember one day he, made, he told us, I think that Krishna's arm is getting tired. Make a cane for him. And everybody was just, you know, everything that Prabhupada did, we thought, how does Prabhupada know these things? Of course, we didn't know that every deity in India has a cane. The Prabhupada said, Krishna's arm looks like he's getting tired. We thought, God, oh, you know, Prabhupada knows that Krishna is getting tired. And he did know. Everything Prabhupada did, we had no cultural background. I remember the first time, you know, I saw Prabhupada, he was going like this, you know. He was going like this, and I just thought, wow, that's really amazing. Then when I went to India, I realized everybody in India goes like this. <laughs> we, everything with Prabhupada did was for us very unique and special. Whatever we knew of India, whatever we knew of Krishna, we learned from Prabhupada. So, this is the theme, practically, of any devotees, any successful devotees' activities are based on the strong desire of his spiritual master and the spiritual master's blessings. And not only does the guru give the instructions, but he gives the strength by which to carry out the instructions. Uh, and we just have to depend upon his mercy. I remember that Prabhupada asked me now, he said, go to Germany uh, because we have to install small little Radha and Krishna deities. So I said, I really, you know, I wasn't very keen on going because Prabhupada wasn't going to go and I wanted to stay with Prabhupada. He said, you just go with everybody and do it. 
So we went to Germany. That was a very nice time. At that time, our Radha Krishna temple was making the uh, top of the pops. Remember the Hare Krishna mantra? I think it got to number 11. In England, in Germany, it went to number 3. And in Yugoslavia, and I think it was Greenland or Iceland, it went to number 1. I remember this because Shem Sundar wrote to Prabhupada that, uh, you know, Hare Krishna mantra is number one in Greenland, and Prabhupada wrote back, Tamal Krishna should go to Greenland. <laughs> so that's why I remember it was number one there. It was either Greenland or Iceland, some godforsaken place. So, anyway, we went to Germany, which was very interesting. It was an arranged tour, and we played at the, st st what is that, Star Club? Yeah, in Hamburg, at the Star Club. It was very interesting because all these people came to hear our rock group, and they were all dancing on the floor, and we were playing our Hare Krishna Kirtan, and they were all dancing to the Hare Krishna. You know, they were arm in arm, as if we were just some rock group, but we were chanting Hare Krishna, and they were dancing. And another place we played was a, it was a, uh, a youth club, very uh, good youth club in another city, and it was so popular that we couldn't, they wouldn't let us go. And finally, we just put on the record and we got out the back door after like hours and hours of chanting. You know, they just were so ecstatic. So there were many nice engagements there. So by Prabhupada's grace, everything became uh, very successful on that tour. So, like this, it can be seen that uh, Krishna consciousness is not difficult if we have uh, faith, firm faith on the orders of Guru. So, uh, of course, there are, I had so much experience like this where Prabhupada, I was fortunate, as Krishna Chaitanya said, to get a lot of association with Srila Prabhupada uh, because I was the most fallen. It's not that, you know, you should not think, oh, this person is highly qualified. He, I was the most disqualified and therefore, I got the opportunity to be with Prabhupada so much. Hey Guru Gyana Dadi Nabandho Sananda Data Karuna Ekashindo Vrindavanashina Hitavatara Prashidaradha Pranaya Prachara Ah, there are things which we can explain from these verses and we will gradually do so. Just like the text which we chanted today, I was only the son of my mother, who was not only a simple woman, but a maidservant as well. So when I read this verse, I wrote Prabhupada a letter, which you may remember from reading Servant of the Servant book. I said, Srila Prabhupada, could he explain something about uh, Narada Muni, who was born, you know, something like I said, the ordinary son of a maidservant. And Prabhupada immediately wrote back in a letter, you should never think that Narada Muni is, was ever an ordinary person. I remember when I read this letter, I was in Paris. And I read it in my hotel room, and the letter practically knocked me over on the bed. It was such a heavy letter that Prabhupada wrote. Because I w didn't just ask about Narana Muni, I asked about Prabhupada and his life. I said, what about your life? What were you? So Prabhupada told me what he was. He said, so far I have understood, and has been told to me. He said, in my previous life I was a doctor, and my life was sinless. He said, so long, so, this was some astrological statement. You know, whether or not we accept it is another matter. The Prophet said, so far it was told to me, in my previous life I was a doctor and my life was sinless. And so far this life is concerned. He said, I had so many opportunities to, for enjoying sense gratification. He said, but at every moment Krishna saved me. And I never remember a single moment you know, when Krishna did not say, and he said that there was never a single time when I ever knew what is meat eating, uh, gambling, intoxication, or illicit sex. In other words, Prabhupada was sinless in his past and sinless in this life. He said, but self, but he said, regarding your question, does it affect in any way how I am your guru? 
He says, does my answer affect in any way how I am your guru? Are you having some doubt about this? Please let me know what is your opinion, Prophet Rafa. So when I got this letter, I was shaking. You know, because I felt like perhaps there was some doubt in my mind. Why did I write that Narada Muni was some ordinary person? Why did I ask about Prabhupada's past? You know, so I was really shaken by this. So I wrote a nice letter to Prabhupada saying that I have no doubt whatsoever. And Prabhupada went on to explain in the letter that there are three types of perfected souls. Those who are perfect by, the, by their eternality. They're eternally perfect. They are never conditioned within this world. And others become perfect through the process of sadhana practices. And still others become perfect by the mercy of the devotee of the Lord or Krishna. He said, but in any case, perfection is perfection, siddha. To become perfect doesn't matter how you get there. Just like a person may get a million dollars inherited, or a person may get a million dollars by earning it through a job, or a person may be given a million dollars by some friend. But one way or the other, you're a millionaire. It doesn't make any difference whether you got it through any one of those three means. Once you have a million dollars, you're called a millionaire. So once you achieve perfection, it is not a question of how. That is not so much the issue. And we should not make distinction. Just like we make, people make so many distinctions in this kind of way, it is wrong uh, that devotees are only sadhakas and therefore, but we cannot say who is perfect. Prabhupada said, what is perfect? Perfect means to follow the perfect path. And perfect means to follow a perfect person. And therefore, that is called perfection. Not only the perfect means that I came into this world dropping from, you know, that I came directly sent by Krishna into this world. It is not that that is the only qualification for being perfect. Prabhupada said that if you're on the path of perfection, and if you're, and if you're strictly following the process of Krishna consciousness, then you're considered to be ideal or perfect. Yeah.